Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for convening this meeting. It was just a few months ago that I was here at a committee meeting, and during a break, I had the opportunity to meet Sidney Walton, who was 100 years old, a World War II vet, who fought with many other Americans to defeat Nazism. And many did not come back and paid the ultimate price to our country. And it's outlandish to think that we are here, 70, almost 75 years later from the defeat of Germany in World War II, fighting white supremacy once again. And this is a bipartisan issue. It certainly should be a bipartisan issue, and I'm glad to see that it is. And it's not just white supremacy, it's extremism, period. We need to fight it on all fronts. But we have seen growth in white supremacy. There's approximately 1,000 hate groups located in the United States uh, spurring out uh, uh, defamatory information and uh, unfortunately, a lot of that is affecting our kids. In my district, in Orange County alone, we've had numerous incidents from uh, an African-American student in my community who has periodically had watermelons thrown on the driveway to a group of students uh, having uh, a party with uh, swastika made out of uh, beer cups to Nazi posters being posted at the schools to uh, uh, graffiti on temples uh, to uh, students that are doing uh, uh, goose stepping and, and salutes while on school grounds and having it filmed and sharing it. So we know that the radicalization is happening and I think the big concern we have for many of us is how the internet is playing into that, into that process. In fact, the Daily Stormer has stated publicly that, quote, my site is mainly designed to target children unquote. Uh, Dr. Blue, can you describe how white supremacists are using the internet and social media to radicalize our children? Absolutely. So this is one of the interesting places where what seems very new to us in the current moment is actually something with deep historical roots. So this movement started getting online on the proto-internet in 1983-84 with a series of coded mes message boards called LibertyNet. Now those message boards included the things that they needed for immediate race war, like assassination lists, infrastructure target lists, um, and ideological content, but it also included things like recipe exchanges and personal ads. So effectively, this movement has been using social network activism to move people around and organize this for decades before Facebook. We are and, and this is a movie we've seen before. It's the same thing that ISIS did as well, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And my only argument with that is that I don't think they took this from ISIS. I think they've been doing this since the early 1980s completely on their own. Well, what's the answer to address it? How do we uh, address the use of social media to stop the radicalization of our children? I think that's a really great question. I think that one of the things that would help is broadening the interagency conversation around this issue because it occurs to me that the place where the conversations about social network content are happening is at the FTC. Um, and I'm, I'm on fellowship at Silicon Valley this year, so I've been talking to a lot of the tech people. There's all kinds of algorithmic tools, language detection tools, and other kinds of things we can do to get into those internet chat rooms and to look at the person who's by themselves in front of the computer. But the stuff you're talking about is bigger than that because when we're talking about um, the, 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 the stuff like um, postering campuses, white student union, all of that is from the earlier playbook. And what we know from the history is that that kind of public facing stuff that's targeting children has been matched historically by a big paramilitary underground that includes things like taking those children to paramilitary training camps, outfitting them with weapons. And that's how they turn people into soldiers for this movement. Um, people in their teens are enormously recruitable and I think it's absolutely an area of focus. And, and Dr. Geltzer, let me, thank you for your answer. Dr. Geltzer, let me ask you, uh, look, we know that some radicalization literally happens at home. And uh, for some though, many times the parents are, and family members are extremely surprised to find uh, that their, their, their brother, their sister, their child has been radicalized. Are there signs that we should be looking for? Are there ways that we can interject as parents or siblings to try and prevent the radicalization of a loved one? I do think there's a broader role for, for digital literacy in our, in our society that would at least be somewhat helpful with respect to this and frankly other problems that our nation faces. There are other countries that have invested in this idea. Estonia, France is now catching up in trying to ensure at an early age 
that young people who inevitably are using digital devices already have some sense of what not to believe, at least what to be skeptical of, because the internet is never gonna be a, a, a totally curated place. It's gonna have some disinformation, misinformation, uh, and even exhortations to violence. But to empower, especially the youth, to at least be skeptical, to treat that skeptically, and to take it from their digital experience to their parents, to their real world connections, and ask about it and engage in a conversation, I think that's an important direction to go in. May Thank I you. Add nice. Thing? Or at yes. least. Um, the gentleman's time has expired, but you can answer the question if you want to say a word. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add that another place that this dovetails, it, there's a conversation about general sort of, um, general mass attack <clears throat> and the role of young teen boys particularly in being drawn into kind of mass shootings, um, partly through internet um, activity. Um, Health and Human Services might consider doing something like giving grants to nonprofits like Life After Hate and the Free Radicals Project, which are staffed by people who have left the movement um, after their own radicalization and know firsthand how it works and how to reach people who are right now in these groups or who might be pulled in. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman, and thank you again for convening this meeting.